Shabbat Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so very much for joining us on our Father's Seventh-day Sabbath. And thank you for keeping our Father's Seventh-day Sabbath, a day that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations forever. God bless you, everybody. I'm Pastor Scott Lane with Holy Impact Ministries, and I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody out there at YouTube, everybody at Rumble, everybody at Odyssey, everybody at the uh, Holy Impact Ministries website, Facebook, wherever it is that you might be watching this from. God bless you. Welcome, 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 and happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Wa- Hanukkah week begins this evening at sundown, and uh, so we are very excited about that, and uh, we are ready to get into the uh, remembrance of Hanukkah. And uh, this uh, morning, we're going to be talking about the uh, second part of our series entitled The Sin of Christ Mass versus Hanukkah. And uh, if you weren't with us last week, uh, I'd like to encourage you to go back and take a look at that. You can find it at our website at holyimpactministries.com. It's right on the front page there. Uh, But again, the first part of this uh, was very, very important. And again, the uh, last part of it is going to be today. We're going to be talking a little bit more along the lines of Hanukkah and what that means. We'll go through a little bit of what we went through last week, just a very short uh, synopsis. Uh, But we're going to be basically talking about Hanukkah and the differences between the two and what what the differences between these two festivals are. One is, again, man made and man ordained. And the other one is God made and God ordained, and so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're also going to be talk about uh, talking about is Hanukkah in the Bible? Is it in the Old Testament? Uh, uh, many people say no. Many people say that Hanukkah is not in the Old Testament. But I would refute that accusation. 
I believe that Hanukkah is in the Old Testament. We're going to talk to you about that uh, this this morning, and uh, we're going to help you to make sure that you can identify what Hanukkah is all about and where you can find Hanukkah in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And so lots to talk about uh, here this morning. So we are going to go ahead and just jump right into things because we have a plethora of information for you this morning. And we got a lot of scripture that we want to go through and uh, some historical uh, information. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a short uh, pause here for just a couple of moments. And when we come back, we're going to move right into the sin of Christ mass versus Hanukkah part two. Stay with us. You'll be very glad that you did. Christmas is a festival that many modern-day Christians around the world proclaim to be the most holy day of the year. But just how holy is this festival of Christmas exactly according to Scripture? It's written that what is holy belongs to God. And therefore, for this festival to be holy, it must be of God. And so the question then becomes... Is this festival called Christmas something that comes from God? Or is this festival opposed to everything that God himself has taught us from the very beginning? Does this festival called Christmas exalt the Son of God? Or does this man-made festival according to both history and the Bible itself profane his holy name along with those who willfully and intentionally indulge in it? The truth of the matter, according to both history and the Bible itself, is that this very man-made festival could well affect our very salvation. And not only our salvation, but the salvation of our children and our children's children for generations to come. What are the facts? What does history reveal to us concerning this most favorite festival of the world? And most importantly, what does the Bible say about it and those who practice it. Do you know? Or do you think that you know? Welcome back, everybody. God bless you, and thank you for staying with us. And so, once again, I'd just like to say welcome uh, to everybody this morning and say thank you so very much for sharing your time with us as we continue our study into this particular portion uh, entitled The Sin of Christ Mass versus Hanukkah. Now, last week we spoke in some detail about why it is that the Roman Catholic created festival of Christ Mass is indeed a sin on so many different levels. We know, first off, that the birthday of our Messiah is not recorded anywhere within the confines of our God-breathed scripture. We also know that December 25th is the birthday of Mithra and Tammuz and the sun gods that the Roman Catholic Church worships. Nor are the birthdays of any of his apostles 
or any high priest or any patriarch found in the Bible. Literally, none of God's children have their birthdays recorded within the confines of the 66 books of our Bible. The fact of the matter is that a person was originally celebrated at their death, not their birth. The apostles never never celebrated their birthdays. The prophets never celebrated their birthdays. And there are only two birthdays mentioned anywhere within the confines of the 66 books of our Bibles. And those two birthdays were the birthdays of two pagan kings who both committed murder on their birthdays. One of them was the pharaoh of Egypt who murdered his baker during the days of Joseph. And the other one was King Herod who murdered John the Baptist on his birthday, having him beheaded. Other than these two pagan kings, there really are no birthdays recorded in the Bible, because birthdays were not celebrated back in those days by anyone other than the pagans. And this is something to, once again, think about when considering the sin of Christ Mass. You know, as we saw last week, according to to Deuteronomy chapter 12, our Father in Heaven warns us against idolatry. And he tells us very clearly that he does not want to be worshipped as the pagan gods were worshipped. This, in of itself, my friends, is a sin. When we worship our God the way that the pagans were worshipped, we are transgressing his spoken word. And according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 of the New Testament, the biblical definition of sin is indeed the transgression of the law. In other words, when we do something that God says, do not do, that is sin. And therefore, we can also be rest assured that lying to our children is also a sin. According to Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, it is written that we shall have no other gods before our Father in heaven, who is the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And furthermore, it is written that we are not to create graven images of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Lying to our children about the birthday of our Messiah is not only a sin, I would contend that it is indeed a blasphemous sin. Lying to our children about a Roman Catholic-created toy god by the name of St. Nicholas, or lying to our children about the divination of his Krampus elves that have traditionally come from the pit of hell itself, or lying to our children about the divination of magical flying reindeer, or lying to our children about dragging an evergreen tree into the house, so that they can bow down to it in order to receive their gifts, all clearly qualify as sin. And this is exactly why the devil has us doing it. But to do it in order to honor the birth of our Messiah is indeed the highest order of blasphemy that could ever be undertaken by mankind. It is indeed a mockery a slap in the face to the authority that he holds and the sacrifice that he has made for us all. The circus, the literal circus of the Roman Catholic-created Christ Mass was created for this very reason. It is a slap in the face to our Messiah and to his Father in heaven who sent him. And my friends, I don't want us to make any mistake about that. When we lie in the name of Yeshua, that is blasphemous. It is indeed blasphemous. Everything that our Messiah represents has literally been stolen by Roman Catholicism and its demonically inspired christ mast circus. The little cre- literal creation of old St. Nicholas is nothing but the devil incarnate who loves to dress himself up like an angel of light in order to replace our Messiah in the eyes of our children. And therefore, it is indeed with great pleasure this morning that we conclude this portion of our very factual and very biblical study here this morning by moving on to a much more pleasant topic, 
which is indeed the topic of Hanukkah. You know, every year I receive letters from people who are so very, very thankful that we are helping people to understand the Christian significance of Hanukkah, which is also known as the Feast of Dedication. And therefore, this year, it is with great pleasure that we bring you this study concerning the biblical importance of Hanukkah and what it means to us as modern-day Christians and all who have been grafted into the house of Israel that is indeed the apple of Yahovah God's eye. This is very important, my friends. And one of the first things that I'd like to do here this morning is to have us turn to Galatians chapter 3 of the New Testament so that we might understand that according to our god breathed scripture, those of us who have been baptized into our Messiah have indeed put on the very spirit of our Messiah. And therefore, according to his god breathed scripture and his god breathed scripture alone, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free. In fact, there is not even a male and a female in the eyes of Yahuwah God our Father. For we have all become one in the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek. And if, and there's that humongous word again, if, if you are the Messiahs, then you are Abraham's offspring and you are an heir according to the promise of Yahuwah God to Abraham. And, you know, I love to show this particular scripture even though there are a multitude of scripture that explains this very concept in great detail, just as Paul does in Romans chapter 11, because I find it troubling today that most modern-day Christians today have no idea what they've been grafted into. They, have, they are completely oblivious to what they have been grafted into. We have Christians out there today who claim to be Christians, and yet claim to be separate and apart from the house of Israel because they have been wrongly told that their denominational empire has replaced the house of Israel and has become the new Israel in the eyes of Yahovah, the one true Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This, my friends, is called replacement theology. And replacement theology is just as big a lie as December 25th being the birthday of our Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. And therefore, it's important that we break the bonds of this deception that has been taught for generations by wicked and despotic wolves in sheep's clothing who love to dress themselves up like angels of light in order to fool, if possible, even the very elect. And we could go on and on and on about all of these despotic and degenerate deceptions and abominations that the church today has drug into the house of God just like the Pharisees and the scribes had done back during the days of our Messiah and the apostles. But I don't want to concentrate on that here this morning. What I want to concentrate on is how important the Jewish people were and still are to our Father in heaven. What is this Hanukkah that they celebrate? And does it belong to the Jews only? Many say that Hanukkah is not found in the Old Testament Bible or the Torah, but I would contend that Hanukkah is indeed found all throughout the Old Testament in the Bible, and the New Testament as well. And this may be a shocking revelation for many people. But you see, Hanukkah has everything to do with dedication and the temple of Yehovah God. How important do you suppose that the temple of Yehovah God was to our Messiah? I'd like us to take a close look at John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Let's turn to the book of John this morning. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 says this. It says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he turned over their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered 
that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Hanukkah is all about the restoration of God's house, his temple, that was desecrated by a man who thought that he was God on earth. A man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes back in about 167 BC. When Antiochus Epiphany attacked Jerusalem and the Jewish people and put a stop to the constant practice of the offering of the daily sacrifice for about three and a half years. Antiochus Epiphanes ordered an altar to Zeus to be created and erected in the temple of God. And he banned the circumcision of the Jewish children and ordered pigs to be sacrificed at the altar of the temple, among other horrendous things that he did, to torture and even murder many of the believing Jews. Hanukkah is all about the Jewish people fighting back against an extraordinarily huge, professionally trained military in order to retake possession of the temple of Yahovah God and to put it back into order so that the temple would still be standing in order uh, for our Messiah to arrive on the world stage. And this, once again, is important to understand. Psalms chapter 69, uh, verse 7. Hold on here. We, before we get into that, I just want to go back to, uh, to this here very quickly first. You know, the point that I want to make very, very clearly here this morning is that the importance of this temple, which was known as the house of Yahuwah God, and the importance of this temple that Hanukkah represents, was written about long ago, back in the beginning of the Bible, back in Exodus chapter 25, when it was uh, a mere tent, also known as the tabernacle. The tabernacle that was created in the book of uh, Exodus became the temple that stood in Jerusalem. And the temple that stood in Jerusalem was indeed Yehovah God's house, according to our Messiah, who had such zeal for that temple that he created a whip out of some cords and went into that temple and kicked over the tables of the money changers and chased them out of his father's house. And I want us to pay close attention to John chapter 2, verse 17, where it is written that the disciples remembered what was written. What was it that his disciples remembered that was written? And where was it written? It was written in the Old Testament in Psalms chapter 69, verse 7 through 9, that zeal for the house of Yahuwah God would consume our Messiah. Let's read that in Psalms chapter 69, verses 7 through 9. Psalms chapter 69, verses 7 through 9 says this, For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproach of those who reproach you have fallen on me. This is the scripture that the apostles remembered when they saw our Messiah cracking that whip inside his father's temple and kicking over those tables of the money changers and chasing them out of his father's house. And so the question then becomes, if this temple, if this house of Yahuwah God was something that our Messiah had zeal for, something that our Messiah protected with his very life, something that he honored and believed was sacred, then how should we, who have been commanded to follow him, and to do as he did and to walk as he walked should feel about our Father's temple. Was the temple only found in the story of Hanukkah? Is dedication only found in the event of Hanukkah? Is zeal for our God's house only found within the story of Hanukkah? Was Antiochus Epiphanes the only one who had desecrated the temple of Yehovah God? Did the Babylonians not also destroy the temple of Yehovah God and drive the Jewish people into bondage in Babylon for 70 years back in 587 BC? Hanukkah was all about the fight of the Jewish people because of their zeal and dedication for the house of God. Hanukkah is all about what happens when we fight 
for what is right in the eyes of Yahuwah God. Hanukkah is all about all things being possible with Yahuwah God. Are all things only found in the event of Hanukkah? Is that the only place we find these things? Are all of these things new concepts that we've never heard before? You see, the story of Hanukkah is preserved in the books of First and Second Maccabees, which describe in great detail the redemption of uh, or the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem and the relighting of the menorah after a great battle between the Jewish people and a formidable military occupation. What's important to understand about First and Second Maccabees is that they were originally included in our King James Version of the Bible when it was first published back in 1611. But during the English Civil War, the Westminster Confession of 1647 included the apoc- or excluded the Apocrypha from the canon and claimed that the Apocrypha, which included the books of Maccabees, were not inspired by God, but were simply other human writings about God. And therefore, the British Foreign Bible Society in the early 19th century decided not to print it. Keeping all of that in mind, many of these apocryphal books are considered canonical by the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian Church today. Most of us accept the Apocrypha for instruction in life and the idea that they do have some truth within them, but they are not necessarily for the establishment of doctrine. Keeping all of that in mind, It's also good to know that the Protestant Apocrypha contains only three books, and that's 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, and the Prayer of Manasseh. And these are also accepted by many Eastern Orthodox churches and Oriental Orthodox churches as canonical. But these three books are regarded regarded as non-canonical, which means they don't believe they, they belong in the Bible, according to the Roman Catholic Church and are not therefore included in modern Roman Catholic Bible. And so, that in a nutshell is a short history of the book of Maccabees and why some denominational churches accept them as canonical, which means that they believe that they are inspired and they belong in the Bible, and why some churches do not. However, we do have outside historical references that also agree with and tell us about the event of Hanukkah, and one of them, of course, was the Jewish historian Josephus, who had much to say about the historical event of Hanukkah and the rededication of the temple before our Messiah came onto the scene. And the Jewish rabbis themselves also have their take on the historical event of Hanukkah that is written within what is known as their Mishnah, which is nothing more than the oral laws of the rabbis that our Messiah literally hated. And we'll come back to that in a few moments. But before we do, I'd like to point to the biblical reference of Hanukkah found in the New Testament in John chapter 10. And I'd like us to read John chapter 10 verses 22 through 39 so that we might understand that our Messiah was indeed at the temple for the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. Hanukkah means dedication, by the way. And so, this is very important for everybody to understand. So, before we do that, it's important to understand that, again, Hanukkah itself means to dedicate. On on Hanukkah, the Maccabean Jews regained control of Jerusalem and rededicated the temple, and therefore it is known in John chapter 10 as the Feast of Dedication. It's not called Hanukkah, but the Jewish people would have called it Hanukkah. In our English translated Bibles, it's called the Feast of Dedication, which is still what many Jewish people call it today. So keeping all of this in mind, I'd like for us to now read down through John chapter 10 so that we can understand exactly what was taking place during the Hanukkah celebration while our Messiah was at the temple, because this also is extremely important to make note of. And therefore, let's turn to John chapter 10 this morning, verses 22 through uh, 39. And let's see exactly what was going on during that event. John chapter 10, verse 22, begins by saying, 
At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Yeshua was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him, and they said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, the Anointed One, then tell us plainly. And Yeshua answered them. And he said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do my father in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Yeshua answered them, I have shown you many good works for my Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It's not for good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Yeshua answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world you're blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. And so here we find our Messiah in John chapter 10, verse 22, at the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, arguing with the Jews. And more importantly, It's important to make note of what he was doing at the temple during this event. This is where he told the Jews that he was indeed the Son of God in verse 36. And because he told them that he was the Son of God, they picked up stones and they wanted to stone him to death. And there's a lot more within this particular scripture that we could get into concerning the divine counsel of God found in Psalms chapter 8, eight, or I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 82, that our Messiah points to in verses 34 and 35, along with the explanation of why Yeshua said that he and his father were one in verse 30. But for those of you who've been with us at Holy Impact Ministries for any amount of time, you've already heard the explanation of these things, for we have a multitude of teachings and and biblical uh, explanations concerning these Old Testament uh, truths that our Messiah was pointing to. And therefore, I'd like to just remain here this morning on uh, the importance and the understanding of what our Messiah was indeed doing in Jerusalem on the Feast of Dedication at the temple, claiming to be the Son of God, in order to honor and sanctify the Feast of Dedication. And I want us to also notice here in John chapter 10, we do not see our Messiah ever, ever saying, Uh, this Feast of Dedication is false, or this Feast of Dedication is no good, or God does not respect this Feast of Dedication, or this is wrong, or anything like that. Nothing like that. Why was he at the temple in the first place? Was he at the temple to argue with the Jews? No. No, he didn't come to argue. He came because he knew that this was a celebration of his father's temple. And we just saw how he fashioned a a, a whip out of cords and went into uh, his father's temple. We saw the zeal that Yeshua had for his father's temple. This was a big deal to him to be at this temple for the rededication of the temple. It was the Jews that wanted to start arguing. It was the Jews that wanted to stone him to death. Okay? But I want us to understand what's going on here. On, On the very feast of dedication of all times, they're supposed to be here. What are they supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be honoring the temple. And what are they doing? They're trying to kill an innocent man. Do we see the hypocrisy of these Jews that were doing these things? Because I tell you the truth, my friends, this hypocrisy still lives on today in our time. There are people who could care less about Hanukkah, care less about the Feast of Dedication, care less about the temple. 
They could care less because they've traded it for Christ mass. A Roman Catholic created lie. And the Roman Catholic Church has been keeping them so busy that they don't have a clue what Hanukkah is even about. Like the rest of God's feast days that they don't have a clue about. Do you see how this all works? Do you see how wonderfully brilliant that our adversary truly is? The very reason that God wanted that temple standing and in working order is so that it would be in place when our Messiah arrived so that we could see him being the example that he wanted us to be by keeping all of his father's feast days, commandments, and precepts. And so that we could see the Apostle Paul still making sacrifices at the temple in Acts chapter 21, where it is written that the Apostle Paul always lived in observance of the law. That's Acts chapter 21, verse 24, for those of you who are ignorant and unstudied. You see, the temple needed to still be standing so that the proof would still exist as to the fact that God's law does indeed still stand and that not one crossing of a T or one dotting of an I of that law has been made void, nor will it be made void until heaven and earth pass away at the end of the age, according to Revelation chapter 21. The law, just as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7 verse 14, is spiritual and must be spiritually understood in order to still be kept properly today in our time. Keeping all of this in mind, it is important, vitally important, that we also understand that just like everything in the Bible, there are those who will ignorantly argue directly against what the Bible says. There will always be those who will ignorantly argue because they do not trust the Scripture and they do not trust the apostles or what our Messiah and, and what he did as our example because they don't want to follow that example. That's the bottom line. They want to follow the church. But that's not what our Messiah said. In fact, Many modern-day professing Christians today believe that their church is now their example to live by, and that the things that their Messiah did are of no consequence to them or to their children. And this, I would contend, is a sad state of affairs, to say the least. But once again, I'd like to stay on topic concerning the importance of this Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah, this morning. The Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah, is not found per se in the Bible in Leviticus chapter 23, along with all of, other, uh, all of God's other feast days, where all of God's feast days are listed. And again, you can find that in Leviticus chapter 23, if you don't already know that. And therefore, because Hanukkah is not listed in the commandment in the Torah in Leviticus chapter 23, many people feel that they don't have to observe it because it's of no significance to them. But I would submit to you that if it was important enough for our Messiah to attend this feast of dedication, even though he knew that these Jews wanted to kill him, this remembrance should also be important to us. If the zeal for the house of our Messiah was so strong that he was willing to risk his life by fashioning a cord and going in there and, and kicking over tables and, and scaring those people out of there, then it ought to be important to us. We ought to have zeal for that temple. We ought to have the same respect that our Messiah had for that temple. And we ought to be darn glad that our Father in heaven had that temple up and working and in order when our Messiah came so that he could be our example. Where was our Messiah during the feast days of his Father? He was at the temple. Where was our Messiah on the seventh day Sabbath? He was at the temple. And if he wasn't at the temple, he was at the synagogues, teaching and preaching on the seventh day Sabbath. Again, all of this is, is an example. 
and uh, that our Messiah was setting for us. And this is why it was a big deal that this temple had to be there during the time that our Messiah got there. And if you will notice, uh, as soon as our Messiah left, the temple was desecrated and taken away. God took it away in 70 AD. Why did he take it away? Because they had drug all these abominations into it. That's why he took it away from the Jewish people, these Jewish rabbis, these, these, these uh, rabbinical Pharisees. He took it away because of their abomination that they were dragging into the house of God. Where there is abomination, desolation is then required. And that's what happened to the temple. And so, once again, our example is not the church. Our example is not the pope. Our example is not a rabbi. Our example is not a pastor or a priest. Our Messiah is our example. We are to follow him, not some denominational charter. And once we throw that biblical fact to the ground, and once we begin to follow after men and the traditions of men and the doctrines of men and the hermeneutics of men and the philosophy of men, we're no longer worshiping the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his only begotten son that he sent to be our example. Keeping that in mind, there is a Jewish tradition that comes from and is written about in the Jewish Talmud that claims that during the eight days it took to cleanse the temple and to put it back into service and to rededicate it, there was only enough oil to light one menorah for one day. But, Miraculously, somehow, the oil that was uh, only enough to last for one day, supposedly, lasted eight days. The whole eight days that it took to rededicate this temple and to dedicate it properly and to put it back into order. Now, this is where the Hanukkah comes from. And I want us to understand a little bit about what is this. What's a Hanukkah? What is, what is that uh, all about? Well, let's take a, a look at that. I want, to, I want us to talk about that for just a moment. If you'll notice here on the left, we find a Hanukkah, which was created by the Jewish rabbis in order to remember the miracle of the eight days that one day's worth of oil lasted for during the rededication of the temple. Now, on the right side, we find the biblical menorah, which ha was commanded to be created by Yahuwah God to stand in his temple. And this is exactly why many people do not like the Hanukkah. Many people see the Hanukkah as being man-made and the menorah as being God-made. And so they automatically think that there is uh, something uh, that is sacrilegious that is going on here. And they are correct in that understanding concerning one being man-made and one being God-made. But is the Hanukkah sacrilegious or not? Let's be clear. God never commanded anyone to make a nine-pronged lampstand. If you'll notice, the Hanukkah here on the left has nine prongs or candlestick holders, while the God-ordained and mandated uh, menorah only has seven. So, what's important to keep in mind here is that the rabbis are really nothing more, and I want us to understand this. You know, when we start talking about rabbis, what are we talking about? when we start talking about rabbis and things that are written in the Talmud. We need to understand that the rabbis are nothing more than the Pharisees and the scribes of our Messiah's time. That's who they are. Nothing has changed. The Pharisees were the rabbis. They were called rabbi. Okay? So, before we get too far into all of this, I want us to understand when we say rabbi, what are we talking about here? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about the Pharisees. And the scribes, it's still continue on today. It is a red letter commandment of our Messiah that we are not to be called rabbi, for we have one master and we're all brothers. And it's also a red letter commandment that we're not to call anyone on earth our spiritual father, because we have one father who is in heaven. And once again, it's important to understand that our Messiah was not talking about our genetic fathers. Our genetic fathers that uh, come from our human bodies are talked about all throughout the scripture. When our Messiah says to call no man your father on earth, he's talking about no one calling your creator on earth. 
Roman Catholicism and its priests love to be called Father in order to sell the idea or the concept that they are somehow above you and above your family. They are not. Again, they are not. And once again, our Messiah tells us very clearly not to call any man our master because we only have one master, and that's him, the Messiah, the anointed one of Yahuwah God, the only begotten son of God, son of David, son of Abraham. And therefore, just the idea that these men run around calling themselves rabbis is indeed sinful. They are literally breaking a red-letter commandment from our Messiah by allowing others to call them rabbi, which also means great one or master. So, again, uh, we need to understand what's taking place here in front of us. Keeping all of this in mind, it is also written in Ephesians chapter 4 that he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. And therefore, our Messiah was not telling us that God did not give us apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers in Matthew chapter 23. He was simply telling us not to be called anyone's master. And all throughout the Bible, we are commanded to test the men standing behind the pulpit to see whether their fruit is good or rotten. We are not to just blindly follow after some man and what he says just because he says it, or because his charter of men says it. Okay? And so, these are things that we need to be very careful of today in these last days that we are now walking in. These are the evil days that Paul spoke about. These are the last days, my friends. And the devil does indeed know his time is short, and he is doing everything that he can to fool us and to trick us and to sift Once again, no man is our master other than the man, Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the one mediator between God and man. He is the only man that is our master that we are to bow down to and to worship. And therefore, when we hear these stories about a day's worth of oil lasting for eight days, coming from the demonically inspired rabbi whose Talmud tells us that our Messiah is boiling in human excrement, we must question the legitimacy of these traditions that cannot be corroborated within the confines of the Bible. Could they be true? They could be true. The bottom line is that we just simply cannot know for sure. What we do know is that the miracle of the one-day supply of oil miraculously lasting eight days is described in the Jewish Talmud. That's where it comes from. And the Talmud was committed to writing about 600 years after the Hanukkah event described in the book of Maccabees. Okay, so this came about 600 years after the event took place. So once again, this legend comes from the Talmud, which also states that our Messiah is boiling in human excrement. That's the Talmud. So if you want to trust that, which comes from men who call themselves rabbi who are blatantly disregarding the red-letter commandment of our Messiah. And therefore, once we understand these things, we must therefore question the validity of such tradition that has been inspired by these men over 600 years after the event had actually taken place. Did it actually happen? We simply cannot be sure because of the mixing and the mingling of God's word that the rabbis today are involved in. The rabbi has a long history of mixing and mingling the truth of God's word with lies and deception. And because of this, it's, it's kind of like the little boy who cried wolf. Is there a wolf or isn't there? Did this m- miracle truly happen or not? We simply cannot be sure. Although I must say, 
it does sound like something that our Father in Heaven might have done. And so, I just want us to keep that in mind. That is where this idea of uh, uh, the, the Hanukkah comes into play. And that's what the Hanukkah was created for. It was created by the rabbis in order to remember what they say is this miracle that took place. That we don't know whether it took place or not. But it's what they say. It's written in their Talmud. And again, what is the Talmud? I want to be very clear about the Talmud. The Talmud is a mixing and mingling of God's word. It's no different than Catholicism. Catholicism is the exact same thing. It is a mixing and mingling of truth and lie. The devil has woven them together in order to create his own religion, you see. And I tell you the truth, a mixing and mingling of God's word is not God's word. Not at all. And so that's what the Talmud is. It is nothing but a bunch of writings from a bunch of sages, of a bunch of whatever they felt like putting into this encyclopedia called the Talmud. And the Mishnah is nothing more than the Halakha, the blah, blah, blah of the, the Pharisees. The oral law, which our Messiah hated. And again, if you don't understand that, I'd like you to read Matthew chapter 23 and hear all the pet names that our Messiah had for the Pharisees, the rabbinical Pharisees of his time, because of their halakha. They honored him with their lips while their hearts were far from him. Why? Because uh, they were worshiping the God of heaven in vain. And why were they doing that? Because they were teaching as doctrines the commandments of men and not God. They were adding to God's word. They were taking away from God's word. This is a sin. According to their own Torah. But you see, they don't see it that way. They think they can do whatever they want to do and everything's just fine and God's going to bow down to them. That's what they think. My friends, we ought to know better. We ought to know better. And I also want to make this distinction as well. We are not anti-Semitic uh, here at Holy Impact Ministries. And I don't want anybody to get that idea that we are anti-Semitic. We love the Jewish people, the true Jewish people. But if you read the book of Revelation, our Messiah tells uh, uh, the assemblies there. He says, I am glad that you do not believe in these Jews who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. What did our Messiah call the Jewish rabbinical Pharisees of his time? He said, you are children of the devil. Why? Because your father, the devil, is a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. It's his character to lie. You travel over land and sea to make one follower. And when you do, he's nothing more than a twofold child of hell, more so than yourselves, says our Messiah in Matthew chapter 23. So we're not so keen on these men who call themselves rabbi, but we love the Jewish people. Our Messiah was and is and always will be a Jew who came from the house of David in the tribe of Judah. Okay? And we understand that. We're smart enough to know and to understand that the Jewish people have always been the apple of God's eye and always will be. And that's another reason why we stand together. We have been grafted into that house of Israel. Remember, Judah is the Jews. There's only one tribe out of 12 tribes. So we need to remember that. We need to understand that. Okay. And so, but again, as Paul tells us, the oracles of God were given to the Jews. And so they have truth. Now, they've, many of them have mixed it and mingled it and twisted it, and we don't know what to believe anymore because of what they have done. And again, this was going on in our Messiah's time. He told us that these things were going on. This was the big battle. That's why they hung him on the cross, because they didn't like him interfering with their nonsense and their lies and their man-made halakha, their, their Mishnah, their oral nonsense that disagreed with the Torah. 
And they believe is just fine. It's just okay. It's just all right. Because they believe they are gods. No, 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 no. But we love Hanukkah because we love the Jewish people. Not the rabbi so much. Because we know who he is. But we love the Jewish people. We love the Jewish people who are seeking the truth the same way that we're seeking the truth. And many Jewish people know exactly who their Messiah is. And many people knew even back then. Not all of the Jews rejected him back then. And we need to make sure that we understand that as well. So it's not all the Jews. Read Romans chapter 11, hear what Paul says, and you'll know better than that. It's not all Jews. It was only the the Jews that rejected him that were cut out of the olive tree or the olive vine uh, that uh, is the house of Israel. That's another whole teaching uh, that we can get into. But one of the traditions concerning this Hanukkah that is supposed to represent this miracle is that each night throughout the eight-day holiday, one candle or oil-based light is to be lit. The center candle is called the shamash, which means the attendant. But, once again, this is just a tradition. The Ashkenazim uh, Jews light a full set of lights each and every night, while the Sepharim Jews' custom is to have one set of lights uh, for each entire household. And so the traditions themselves actually fluctuate from Jewish household to Jewish household. The purpose of the Shamash candle in the center is meant to adhere to the prohibition specified in the Talmud against using the Hanukkah lights for any other purpose other than publicizing and mediating the Hanukkah miracle. Now, I find this to be a good thing. Okay, so in other words, what these rabbis are saying is that this Shamash candle and the Hanukkah can only be used to light the Hanukkah for the celebration of Hanukkah and nothing else. It can't be used for anything else. And therefore, they did not create the Hanukkah to be a replacement for the menorah, as so many believe. Nor did they create the Hanukkah to be used in the temple as a replacement for the menorah. The Hanukkah was simply created in order to help the Jewish people remember a tradition that reminds them of the power of Yahuwah God and is to be used in their homes in order to remember this miracle of one day's oil lasting eight days. Okay? And so I just want to put that to rest. I want to put that to bed for uh, a lot of people out there who are saying, oh, this is pagan. Oh, this is a terrible thing. And, and well, is it or isn't it? Did the miracle happen or did the miracle not happen? We don't know whether it happened or not. We surmise maybe it did, but we don't know that whether it happened or not. But this Hanukkah was not meant to ever, ever be uh, uh, something that was used in the temple or for temple service or, any, or to replace the menorah in any such way. It was only used for Hanukkah to remember this particular miracle. Okay, and that's written in their Talmud. Okay, so if that's the, if that's the case, then, and that's what they made it for, then it certainly was not made for any malicious intent it was simply made to remember this miracle if <laughs> if the miracle did indeed happen. If it didn't happen, then it's a lie, and a lie is a lie is a lie, which is a sin. So we don't know. We don't know. And so, therefore, some choose to have a Hanukkah in the house to help celebrate Hanukkah, which was the rededication of the temple, while others refuse to have a Hanukkah in the house because it's man-made and it's not God-ordained. Now, one thing that I would like to make evidently clear is that not all of man's traditions need to be commanded by God. And I want to repeat that again. All of man's traditions do not need to be commanded by God. The Jewish people have many traditions that are very beautiful and that are not commanded by God. But some of these traditions do help them teach their children about God and the fact that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all things seen and unseen. And with God, all things are indeed possible. It was indeed his 
word that created all things, just as we see in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis in the beginning of the Bible. Okay? So, uh, I, we're going to take a short break here for just a moment. But before we do that, we're, once we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about how should we celebrate Hanukkah and how we shouldn't celebrate Hanukkah and what's adding to God's word and what's not adding to God's word. Because we want to be very careful uh, about that. We don't want to wind up being like Roman Catholicism or the rabbis who have just heaped all this nonsense uh, onto the truth of God's word and added to his word and taken away from his word, which according to Deuteronomy is a sin. Uh, we don't want to do that. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But uh, I just want to make that evidently clear here this morning, because uh, this is very, very important. There's a lot of arguing going on between should you have a Hanukkah, should you not have a Hanukkah? What does it represent? Is it is it blasphemous? Is it uh, was it made for pagan purposes or in all of these other kinds of things? No, my friends, it was not a pagan uh, idol worshiping thing. It was created by the rabbis, yes, but it was to remember this miracle that they say happened, uh, but we just can't corroborate whether or not it happened or not. Okay, and that's the truth about the Hanukkah. Okay, so you'll have to decide. Uh, whether or not you feel like you ought to have a Hanukkah or you can, you can use a Hanukkah uh, to teach your children uh, about uh, this particular miracle and the rededication of the temple or not. Do you believe that God did that for them? Well, we do know that he gave them the temple back. We know that much. And uh, that was an amazing feat. You're talking about a bunch of Jews with pitchforks and, and, uh, and, and things going up against a military power to regain that temple back, right? It wouldn't surprise me that it, it's possible that it, it did. The problem is we just can't corroborate it. So keep that in mind. That's the truth about the Hanukkah. We're going to be right back in just a couple of minutes. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about, so how do we celebrate this Hanukkah? How do we celebrate this rededication uh, of this temple that our Messiah was so had so much zeal for? Stay with us. We'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back, everybody. And so, therefore, we're oftentimes asked, how is it that we should observe this eight-day rededication of our Father's temple during the season of Hanukkah? Because there is no God-given commandment concerning how to keep and observe this eight-day event, there really is no right and wrong way to observe the Feast of Dedication, which is also known as the Festival of Lights. Some people love to hang blue lights in the house to remind them of who the light of the world is and the fact that he has also commissioned us to be the light of the world. Some people hang no lights at all. Some people have a Hanukkah in the window because it helps them to teach their children, with God all things are possible. Some people light no Hanukkah at all and don't even have one. Some people use a menorah in place of the Hanukkah and some people follow after every tradition of the rabbis, and some people don't. 
Some people give a small gift each one of the eight days to another in order to signify God's gift to us by promising to once again tabernacle with us just as he did with Adam at the end of the age. Some people cook big meals at the end of the eight days. Some people feast all eight days. And so the point is that there really is no right and wrong way to observe the Feast of Dedication and the Rededication of the Temple. And again, you have Ashkenazi Jews doing one thing and uh, Sephardic Jews doing something else. And so, again, there is no commanded list like we have in Leviticus chapter 23 that tells us this is how we're supposed to do things. Okay? So I want us to keep that in mind. This is important to know and to understand. The only wrong thing that you could do in celebration and remembrance of Hanukkah is to demand that everyone else keep Hanukkah the same way that you do. Because that's what God wants. Now you're celebrating Hanukkah wrong. When you start telling people that they've got to celebrate Hanukkah just like you do, and if you do anything outside of that scope, well, you're sinning. That's when you are celebrating Hanukkah wrong. You are adding to God's word and you are taking away from God's word. God never said that. And you should not say that to a brother or a sister because God never said that. Once we demand that the Feast of Dedication needs to be celebrated and kept in remembrance according to our own man-made laws and our own man-made traditions, we are once again adding to God's word and taking away from God's word. And that, my friends, is where sin enters into the picture. And we need to be very intelligent about this, because I hear all kinds of Christians saying all kinds of things about what you can do and what you cannot do according to themselves. And I'd like to once again warn All the holy rollers out there who think that they are very pious and very holy and very above everyone else in the things that they do. But our Messiah warned us about those who make long prayer and love to wear their fringes long and have the best seats in the synagogue and love to be greeted in the marketplaces. That, my friends, is nothing short of vanity, and it is indeed sinful. It is indeed sinful. And I hate to say it, but I know many people who call themselves Torah keepers who are just as bad as the Pharisees and the scribes ever were concerning these things. They think it's all about them. And they love to point the finger at everybody else who's doing something different than they are doing. I tell you the truth, my friends. We need to be on guard for these people. Be on the lookout for these people, for this is not of our Father in heaven, nor is it of our Messiah, who told us that we are to be servants of one another, not one another's masters. Okay? And so there's a fine line between having a tradition and using that tradition to teach your children about the Bible, okay? And and, and then on the other side of the coin, coin, demanding that everybody else do this tradition because God says so. If God says so, you better make sure God said so. You better make doggone sure that God said so. We don't run around saying God says so or it has to be this way because I say so. That's vanity, my friends. That's vanity is what that is. Get rid of it. Take it to the curb and let the garbage man have it. We don't need it. We don't want it. Okay? This is not a time to argue. And I, I hear far too many Christians arguing and bickering and biting back, biting at each other and doing all the kinds of things behind each other's back. Oh, they did. this person got a hot key. Oh, this person puts up lights. Oh, this person gives a gift. This person does this, that, and the other. My friends, that's none of your business. God does not say that you can or cannot do anything concerning Hanukkah. Okay? So, once again, my friends, I despise this kind of person. And I despise these kinds of people that do these kinds of things 
to try to get us to hate one another. And we just wind up arguing and hating one another. For what? We've got plenty to argue about that is truly a sin. Let's not create more sin. Okay? Because that's what we're doing. We're creating more sin, more headiness, more vanity. We don't need it. We don't need it. Again, enjoy, enjoy the Feast of Dedication. Understand the zeal that our Messiah had for that temple and understand that we are now God's temple. And God has, still has a zeal for God's temple. That is us. Understand what dedication means. Okay? We simply need to remember that if we have a tradition that helps our children to understand the power and the glory and the mercy and the majesty and the justice of our Father in heaven, this can indeed be a good thing as long as we don't attempt to insert that tradition into the Word of God as a commandment. This Hanukkah season, my hope and my prayer is that you will also observe the importance of the rededication of Yahuwah God's temple in a very humble manner. Because I tell you the truth, the temple is going to return to the earth when our Messiah returns. And the sacrificial offerings that were offered up in the Old Testament will once again be reinstituted upon the return of our Messiah during his 1,000-year millennial reign as he rules over the nations of the earth with a rod of iron. The prophets all speak of it, and so too does the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And if that surprises you to know that, you need to attend our Bible studies each Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you need to read the Bible for yourself. You need to read the book for yourself. When we contrast this sinful Roman Catholic-created circus of Christ Mass with Hanukkah, there really is no comparison between the two. One festival is man-ordained and man-made, and the other is clearly God-ordained. This was God-ordained. It was God's will to make sure that that temple was there when our Messiah came. And again, it was used as an instrument to help us understand the example that our Messiah was being by being at the temple for the feast days and chasing those people out and having a zeal for it. Hanukkah is found all throughout the Bible. And you may not agree with that, but I want to introduce some things to you if you disagree with that. Dedication, which is what Hanukkah is, is not just taught during the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. Dedication is found all throughout the Bible. Dedication is directly tied to, the, to obedience and the love of God itself. To observe the rededication of Yahuwah God's temple is to observe and acknowledge our rededication to Him as new created beings that have come up out of the watery grave of baptism to be recreated and rededicated to Him. Hanukkah is the perfect shadow picture of a Christian that, that is sinful and born into sin, that goes down into that watery grave of baptism and then is raised up a new creature to be rededicated to Yahuwah God. We are the temple today. And that temple that we are has been rededicated to Him. And we must always remember that according to the New Testament, once again, my friends, we are the temple of Yahuwah God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 uh, and 17. I want to take a look at that uh, here very quickly this morning. Let's see here. It should be, uh, that should be wrong screen there. Where are we going here? Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. I tell you the truth. Our Messiah is still just as zealous for the house of God today that he was yesterday. During this feast of dedication, we should be asking ourselves if there is anything in our temples that Yeshua wants to get rid of. And we must always remember why it is that God chose Abraham to be the father of all nations in the first place. It was not because Abraham sat around saying, I believe, 
with his lips while his heart was far from him. The very reason that Yahuwah God chose Abraham was because of Abraham's dedication. Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. God says to Abraham, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because, why? Because Abraham said he believed? No. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. Just as the Apostle James tells us, in the second chapter of the book of James, faith without works is indeed dead. And the last thing that we as Christians need to be doing in these last days is to be walking around with dead faith. Each and every one of the prophets, each and every one of the apostles, along with our Messiah, were indeed dedicated to Yahovah, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Dedication, my friends, is no small matter. In order to conquer over evil and endure to the end, a great dedication to truth is indeed vital. Vital. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 tells us that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The very name Enoch in the Hebrew is Shanach, which means dedicated which is what the word Hanukkah comes from. And so, too, it is that if we dedicate ourselves and walk with God, he will also take us just as he took Enoch, who was indeed dedicated. Not to mention the fact that the number eight is very significant in the Bible. God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. What happens on the eighth day? Revelation chapter 21 tells us that there will be a new heaven and a new earth because the old heaven and the old earth have passed away. The eighth day is a day of renewal. It represents dedication and renewal. Exodus chapter 20, verse 30. Exodus chapter 20, verse 30 says this, You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother... On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall dedicate it to me. Once again, on the eighth day, the dedication was made. Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 says this. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull, a calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before Yahovah. When? On the eighth day, on the eighth day, once again, on the eighth day, the dedication was made. First Samuel chapter 16, verses 10 and 11 says this, And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, Yahovah has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. What do we see here? Once again, Jesse was the father of David. David was the eighth son. When Samuel went to Jesse looking for the anointed one of God that God had chosen, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Jehovah God said that none of these seven sons were the ones that he chose. You see, it was the eighth son, David, who Yahuwah chose. And why the eighth son? Because eight is once again a number that represents new beginnings and rededication. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. All of the males of God's people were to be circumcised when? On the eighth day, once again, signifying the dedication of that child to Yahovah and a new beginning for that child that was born into sin. All throughout the Bible, 
we see the importance of the number eight. We see the importance of dedication. And we see that the number eight always means something new. The number eight always means dedication. And therefore, there is indeed a plethora of God-given information that we can teach our children during the remembrance of Hanukkah. And why it is so vitally important for us to remember that a new heaven and a new earth will be established and a rededication of God's people is indeed required for those who will take part in that new heaven and in that new earth that is to come. And so let me ask you this. Are any of these things taught during the demonically inspired Roman Catholic created Circus of Christ Mass? Have you ever heard any of these things sitting in a church pew on Christ Mass Eve? And were your children truly excited about a new beginning and about a new heaven and a new earth and a newfound love for Yahovah God who is the giver of all things? Or were they only excited about the gifts that they, they would receive in the morning from the pagan Roman Catholic created Toy God St. Nicholas and his devilish Krampus elves. Our children will only know what it is that we tell them. And this is important for us to always remember as parents. It is written that if we train up a child in the way that he should go, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. The question is, which way are we training our children to go? What is it that we are training our children that they will not depart from? How can we expect our children to depart from worldly things and pagan things if this is all that we teach them from the beginning? Do we love our children? And if we do, then why would we teach them to follow after a Roman Catholic created lie instead of the truth of God's word and the importance of his temple and the dedication that it will take to conquer over evil and to endure to the end so that we may receive the crown of everlasting life together as one people. Straight is the gate and narrow is the path and few there be that find it. Many are called but only few are chosen. Not everyone who calls our Messiah Lord is going to enter into his Father's kingdom, but only those who do the will of his Father who is in heaven. Are these things that we need to remember during this season? You bet. You know, the day is soon coming, and we talk about this all the time, when many professing Christians who think that they know their Messiah are going to find out that they never knew him at all. Just like the Pharisees and the scribes who had their Messiah standing right there in front of them and yet could not recognize him. Many professing Christians who call our Messiah Lord are going to claim that they prophesied in his name. They're going to claim that they cast out demons in his name. They're going to claim that they did all kinds of mighty works in his name, only to have him look them dead in the eye and tell them to get away from him because they are workers of lawlessness. I tell you the truth, that day is soon coming. And the number of people that will be told to get away from him is a much larger number than we suspect. There is a remnant, but a remnant, a remnant of mankind that has been chosen separated, elected, and divided for his good purpose, to become a holy nation of priests for his good purpose. My hope and my prayer is that we will choose wisely this season. My hope and my prayer is that we will understand that we cannot drink the cup of Yeshua and the cup of demons. We cannot partake in the table of Yahuwah God and the table of demons. No one can serve two masters, for he will always love the one and hate the other. My hope and my prayer 
is that this season may bring a change for many households and many families. My hope and my prayer is that we have been of some service in convincing the lost not to be lost. With that being said, in closing, I will wish everyone a happy Hanukkah season this season. And I will continue to hope and pray that we will all grow this season by continuing to renew our minds daily and to rededicate ourselves daily so that our Messiah may still be zealous for his Father's temple that we have become. And I will once again ask everyone within the sound of my voice to please take what you've heard here this morning to your own prayer closet. Bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you've heard here this morning be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on his door and on his door alone so that the proper door can be opened to you. And if you will do that, and if you will stay the course, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. I'm Pastor Scott Villain with Holy Impact Ministries, and I just want to say thank you so very, very much for sharing your time with me here this morning. Uh, it is such a precious time, and I truly do hope and pray that you have a wonderful, blessed, beautiful uh, Hanukkah season this season, and these next eight days. Uh, each and every day uh, is another day that we need to, once again, renew our minds. We are told to renew our minds daily, to rededicate ourselves and our lives. Each and every morning when we rise up, the first thing we should do is hit our knees and once again rededicate ourselves and this day that we have before us to be used for Yehovah God and to, to reach out to someone, to help someone, to, to let them know what it is that we believe. And my hope and my prayer is that you'll do that this week. My hope and my prayer is that you'll understand what dedication is all about and that dedication is all throughout the Bible and that the number eight again signifies a new beginning that is going to come. It's on the way. We are closer now than when we first believed. With that being said, I just want to say a quick prayer over us all before we adjourn for our, our Father's seventh day Sabbath. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all name. We thank you, Father Yahovah, for your mercy and for your grace, for the blood that covers our heads. We thank you, Father, for, the, for everything that you have given us. We thank you for this rededication opportunity that we all have. We thank you, Messiah, for bringing this opportunity to us and to our children and our children's children. We thank you for marking us with your seventh day Sabbath and your Ruach Hukadesh that dwells deeply within us. We thank you for your discernment to know and to understand these things. We thank you, Father, for teaching us how it is to be able to navigate through these deceptions that are so fraught throughout the world today. Thank you. Thank you. Messiah for being the light and thank you for showing us how to be the light. And I pray, Father, that you would give us an extra measure of light this Hanukkah season, that we may reach out to someone, we may touch someone, we may start a conversation with someone to help them to know and to understand, not to make themselves friends of the world. In the name of of Yeshua HaMashiach, our blessed Messiah and King. We love you. With that being said, everybody, I just want to say once again, it's been a great honor and a, a great humbling honor to be able to be here with you and to be able to speak these words of truth. And uh, I hope and I pray that uh, once again, we've given you something to take to your prayer closet, test through the fire of prayer and to walk out this week. With that being said, everybody, God bless you. We will see you at fellowship this afternoon. Again, the ladies, uh, 
uh, fellowship will be this Sunday, and I think Sister Jillian, I think, will be back for that, if I understand correctly. Uh, Tuesday, Brother Joe, again, will be hosting the Men's fe uh, Fellowship at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be back next Wednesday, coming up with another installment in the book of Deuteronomy, and why it is that the Bible tells us, and where the Bible tells us, that these feast days that we're reading about in the book of Deuteronomy are going to be reinitiated again uh, when our Messiah returns during his thousand-year millennial reign. Where's that in the Bible? Come Wednesday evening, and we'll show you, take you by the hand, and show you where that says that in your Bible. Uh, with that being said, everybody, we hope to see everybody there. We'll be back next uh, Sabbath, Sabbath day, uh, and we'll be talking again about the book of Matthew. So we'll see you then, everyone. God bless you, and may the face of Yahuwah God shine upon us all and bind us together with unbreakable chains. Shalom, everyone.